Phil. You're in. Hello. Hello. Um, and uh, I'm seeing in the chat line so much love and support for when I was sick the other day. Thank you so much for, for all the well wishes. Um, I'm completely fine now. It's all good. No migraine. Migraines are terrible. Have you had a migraine? They suck. Um, but yeah, I thought maybe we could do this session and have a scientist online have Matthew Shribman to help us pollute a poem. So over the last few days, I've had so many poetry submissions from people and we probably won't be able to go through all of them now. We just don't have time. Um, but maybe we'll go through about four of them. And um, I've gleaned some, some, some lines from different poems and, and I put a poem together, but uh, then we're going to sort of unpack how we're going to write a poem for this Aim High book. So I might just take some time to say hello to everyone. Um, oh, Matthew, have you had your haircut? One Million Sloths wants to know. So many times. I got every single haircut yesterday. <laughs> um, and thanks for noticing, guys. No one else. Phil didn't notice. Um, I, uh, yeah, I've had a haircut. Also, yeah, hi, everyone. Hi, Oliver. Rebecca's here. Gala is here. One Million Sloths is here. Um, I uh, also headaches. I've never had a headache in my entire life. Fact. What? Fact. Yeah, not a single one. I don't understand that. Um, yeah, I don't understand that's... it either. Yeah. I think maybe um, it's because I've so got you... a nice small brain, and as it expands, it's got lots of space to expand into. Mm -hmm. I have no idea how. Uh, that isn't how headaches work. Sorry for misleading people. Anyway, sorry, Phil. Back to you. Uh, no, no. Um, I think that's amazing. Um, I think what we might do now is, uh, wait, we got this from Get Out of the Freezer. I reckon it's the cows. The cows cause the headaches and Matt is friends with all the cows. I do keep close close friendships with quite a lot of cows. Mm. Met a great mm. cow the other day called, oh, what was she called? Not Janice. It took me a while to lure her over, but once I got her over, she was eating grass out of my hand properly. Anyway, this is not the topic. Sorry, Phil. This is not the topic. <laughs> Let's talk about poetry. Okay. <laughs> Um, I'm going to share with you now some poems that uh, that uh, you sent to me either on the Aim High email address or via my Instagram. Uh, let's let's do that now. Okay. Well. All right. Sorry, taking a bit of time to share. Okay. All right, so this one is the first one. It's from Get Out of the Freezer. Um, and Get Out of the Freezer did a really interesting uh, poem about that sort of had some acrostic elements. Um, I might just read some of it. Um, Hush, don't what is speak. It? Oh, sorry. Let the, let the sand wash over your feet like the waves that crash in the shores complete with beauty where land and ocean meet. A locked embrace of nature's love. Hush, don't look. Just feel the breeze as it softly shook. The maiden up high in the lighthouse nook. Where she laughs for the ones that the seas never took. For they envy her so. This is, has a great rhythm to it. Hush, don't leave. The water, it calls you. It tumbles and weaves through minds of mountains as they disbelieve this stolen promise. The maiden deceives when you turn your back as you will hush don't cry just stare at the blissfully ignorant sky as the sun beams down to that lighthouse eye where the maiden watches the waves pass by parades of blue and thralling hush stay still if you look away once it will suffer until you have nothing but memories threat thought and thrill as the maiden she falls, no intention to kill, but she did, and the sea died with her. Great poem from Get Out of the Freezer. Wow. Um, uh, incredible. Uh, yeah. I, from, from this screen sharing, I can't really see any of the comments, so maybe, Matthew, you can uh, respond and, uh, to some of the, the comments in the chat. But uh, I, mean, I, I loved it. 
I love this poem. There's a lot of wow. It's so beautiful. This is the first time. This is the first time I've 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 seen this poem. But yeah, it's really amazing. Um, Green Mango Man is saying I suck at writing. Honestly, I used to think I sucked at writing, and uh, I still do a lot of the time. But every now and then, I force myself to write a poem, uh, and and they often come out surprise surprisingly okay. Uh, and I think often it just takes quite a bit of bravery to just just try and start putting pen to paper. And if you don't mm -hmm. practice, then you, you you remain bad at them. So I encourage everyone to try. Um, mm. Also, sorry, I wanted to ask you, uh, well, one of the things that this made me think about this poem was the book, Eunoia, that we were talking about before on our last duo, and about how the, the, those poems where the entire poem was just one single vowel all the way through, so there's only A's or I's or O's or U's in the entire poem, if mm. anyone was watching that before. Because some of the, like the, the page before, there were, there were a lot of E's and then there were a lot of I's all the way through and it had like a similar feel to it. And I, I loved the different character that that brought to the poem. Anyway, that was my comment. Mm -hmm. Carry on, Phil. Ignore me. No, no, I, it, you're right. Um, can you can you see my screen sharing yeah. right now in between pages? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the... Uh... Oh, I don't know what we can see now. At the moment, we can see... On your iPhone uh, or iPad. It's gone offline. Yeah. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Um, so the, uh, yeah, the, the second stanza here, the, you have words like cry, ignorant sky, lighthouse high, um, uh, all of that, the, the sort of the eyes there and that eye sound. And then um, I, I love the rhythm of this poem. I feel really bad because um, I've sort of highlighted a few passages and few kind of phrases in this poem. And I want to ask you later on why you think I've highlighted these passages. Um, but we'll um we'll get to that. I wanna to, wanna to get to another poem that someone submitted to me. This is Olive, I think Olive 2008. Um uh this is a very different poem. Um I really love it. It's tell a nice story. Damn, the toothpaste's finished, washed it out. Watched the little beads go down the sink, heard them wash away. Down they went into the sewer. Out they went into the rivers. Out they went into the oceans, floating there forever until the fish came and gulped them down. There the beads sat fizzing, but not budging. And then the fish went back to their friends. They swam some more. They came to a river and swam upstream. They jumped and wriggled in, and then the claw went in, the fish and into the jaw of the bear. The little beads, remember those? Settled in the bear's stomach, the bear curled up for the longest hibernation of them all. Damn, the toothpaste's finished. I love this, this is cool. Um, <laughs> it is a whole journey, a whole life cycle. Um, I love how it begins and ends at the same point. Um, I love the little kind of the humor in here, uh, even if it's dark humor, like the longest hibernation of them all from that bear. Um, uh, I don't know. Uh, what do you like on in the chat, Matthew? What do you like? Yeah, Miz um, is saying really good. One million sloths is saying wow. Get out of the freezer is saying that's actually so cool. OML and. Um, Gabriel is saying flamingo. I don't know what that means. <laughs> um, but uh, and also someone was that a green manga man was saying, "Are you going to write in sonnets and octets?" And I don't know if they were asking me, but I'm not so sure about sonnets, like how sonnets and octets work. I remember I learned about sonnets, but I can't remember the exact structure. This is also part of why I'm here is to is to relearn a load of poetry stuff. In fact, Phil, you said a word earlier, acrostic. What does that mean? Acrostic. Yeah, uh, acrostic. Uh is just uh, each line begins with a letter and they add up to a word for each chapter. So you remember making like a card for your mum for Mother's Day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you'd have that mother, yeah. But wait, wait. So My, the... what a wonderful woman. Oh, oh, to be a son of yours. <laughs> You know, anyway. Wait, so, um, so was the first poem an acrostic? Because if it was, I'm just... Well, it had an acrostic element to it. Uh, if we look at it here... Um, oh, is in the, the letters going through the green ones? Yeah. We still have time. 
Whoa, okay, I'm just too dyslexic to have noticed that. This is the thing. There's always so much stuff hidden in poems that eludes me. I love poems, but I'm just, I'm very bad at finding the important bits. We can do this. <laughs> um, uh, this is great. Um, I'm going to move on to the next poem. Um, this is submitted by Maddie. I think it's Maddie Hay. Um, I asked for a poem to do with the ocean, uh, which was the first one was, and I guess the second one was too. This third one, I wanted a poem that was really pretty and really beautiful um, because for this lesson here, we want to pollute this poem. Um, so this is a very beautiful, pretty poem about the ocean. It's called When Your Bones Go Numb. I know how to stop time. Watch your troubles dispel as your thoughts turn sublime. Bow your head and see a white horse tenderly kiss celestial shores. Sporadic moments of sheer bliss when she ventures out further, lulled into her abyss. Soon you're cocooned by an icy elixir that glazes your skin with balmy whispers. And when your bones are numb, time does stop. So bow your head and see this white horse. Wow. Cool poem. Well done, Maddie. Um, so this is obviously uh, a poem about the ocean. Um, what do you think in the chat, what do you think this poem means? What do you think, um, or, or actually, that's a, that's, a, that's a dumb teacher question. What does this poem make you feel? What yeah, does this poem make you feel? I was going to say, as soon as you asked what it means, I was like, immediately went into like panic mode of, oh no, this is what I'd be asked yeah. at school. And then as soon as you asked me what it made me feel, I was like, that I can answer because I was feeling yeah. stuff, but yeah. I would always have to go through to like rethink about what it means. Mm -mm -mm -mm. And that's the thing, you only enjoy going through to figure out what it means if it made you feel something really powerful. Um, mm. Which this, I just I just had this feeling. I'm really interested to know what people in the in the chat think. Like, what what did it make you feel? Because for me, I, I I could like feel this water like washing all over me, but it was it wasn't it wasn't cold. It was like just refreshing, and it felt very light and um, almost like you know that effect when someone with really long uh, long hair like kind of brushes it against you, and it was like that kind of <laughs> feeling of gentleness. Um, that was mm. for me. Uh, but I, yeah, what did you guys think? So Rebecca Carmen is saying it makes me feel really calm. And Oliver is saying I felt refreshed. Um, mm. And Gela Fries is saying it makes me want to write poetry about how, how beautiful nature is. Uh, yeah, it's a great, it's a great poem, isn't it? Yeah, I really like the mm. metaphors about, about the sea. I also I also feel I, I, I wanted to say as, as well on Olive on your on your poem it was um I also thought it was so great how it how it ended in the same way that it began and I really loved being taken on that on that journey because that's like it's creating that emotional connection from the beginning to the end that I think people miss and people are like oh no it doesn't matter just like pouring it down the sink and what you what you did with that is you 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 gave people a very uh, like simple, easy to visualize process of this is this is what is going to happen if you allow these things to go down the sink and it is already happening. Um, and I, I I was like feeling as if it's harder to relate to fish, I guess, because they're not mammals. But the bear, I was imagining being the bear with my plastic full of stomach with my stomach full of plastic beads, and it was yeah, it was a disaster. Um, anyway, sorry, Phil, back to you. No, that's great. No. Um, uh... So anything else from the chat? Uh, what did this make you feel, this, this poem here? Um, so we've got the same, the same things that was, that was said before. I wonder actually, Phil, sorry to stop everyone, but have you got your, have you got your phone? Because I could give you the link to the chat on your phone if you want. Yeah, I'll do that. Or I could, I, I'll send it to you. Quick pause just, yeah. while we get Phil the, 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 the <laughs> Um, uh, I love, I love, uh, this poem by Maddie, how it uh, uses the metaphor for a uh, white horse, which for me conjures an image of, of kind of like a breaker, a wave kind of crashing in to, um, to the shore. And I love as well that it's not just describing the ocean, it's describing your experience with the ocean. So you start off kind of 
um, like describing the white horse tenderly kissing celestial store shores. But then what does that mean for you? It's sort of moments of sheer bliss. It's your cocoon by an icy elixir glazes your skin. Um, I also like the darkness of it as well. You have that sort of ongoing thing about when your bones are numb and time does stop, which kind of makes me think a little bit about death, which I don't know, adds a nice little darkness to the poem. Um, I think this is great. I think this is a great poem. I think we could pollute this poem. Um, but we're going to go and see one more poem um, that someone submitted. Uh, this one here is from One Million Sloths, who we've had already. Uh, let me just get into this chat. Plastic beans are not as tasty as regular beans, no. But they look tasty. And that's the thing, isn't it? Like, uh, this is something I've never understood about cupcakes. Like, people always go for those cupcakes that have all the icing on top and that look really delicious. But those aren't the delicious cupcakes. The delicious it's all about it's all about the, the cupcake dough. Um, but mm. obviously, if you're a seabird, then you're you're quite you quite often will just go for the delicious looking cupcake in brackets, the shiny plastic bead, instead of the the delicious um, home cooked shrimp or whatever it may be. Uh, and that's that's one of the big problems is plastic just does look like such an attractive food to to sea creatures. Um, Let's go. Are you ready to go through this poem, Phil? Uh, all right. <laughs> oh, cool. I've got the chat. Yummy beads. One million stuffs. Wow, that was deep. All right. <laughs> wow, that was deep, man. Um, uh, yes, gloaming, gloaming is no more. Um, so again, this is an acrostic poem. The horror beyond. Uh, the horror beyond the horizon. The ocean is now dank and brown, her delicate skin ripped off. Environmental embarrassment is she, how we ruined it all. Oh, how it is our fault, relying on her nutrients, relying on her, on and on, did we not care? Rescue is too late. Bye-bye, ocean, everlasting fear. Yonder is not happy, off goes the switch of life. Never will the cycle repeat. Do not waste your time. The things that we did, her feelings were demolished. Entering this land of horrors, hoping that she will return, open armed with glee, rest assured that it won't happen. Zagged, of course, she will not come. Oh, woe, oh, please. Not yet this story has begun. Okay, so we got another uh, great acrostic poem from One Million Sloths. I think One Million Sloths, you already submitted a great acrostic poem. Again, this is about the ocean. Um, I, I love how you personified the ocean here. This is really cool. Um, uh, get out of the freezer. That's so cool. Uh, you'll be hella talented. Um, I have, uh, highlighted in this poem, this line zagged off course. And I've also highlighted, uh, I've also highlighted some other pieces from other poems and I'm just going to go through it now just really quickly flick through it um white horse um fizzing but not budging thought and thrill parades of blue tumbles and weaves softly shook okay my question to everyone in the chat is what do these all have in common or why do you think that I might have highlighted these parts, these poems? What do you think? They are long lines. Hmm. Maybe I've got them here to refresh your memory. Sorry about my terrible handwriting. I like handwriting. It looks friendly. <laughs> it looks like, um, it looks like a, a 10 year old boy's handwriting. Yeah. You are a 10 year old boy. You switched bodies <laughs> a few weeks ago. 
<laughs> My handwriting um, is like the same, right? <laughs> we both got stuck at ten year old boy handwriting. <laughs> they are very thought out and represent life. It does look friendly. It's better than mine, Phil. Don't worry. Thanks, get out of the freezer. Personification. I um, I, I feel a bit cheaty with this. The the thing that these all have in common is that I have included them all uh, in a poem that I've written about the ocean, and I took lines that um, kind of stood out to me that I thought, oh, this is a nice little description. Um, I might have accidentally changed budging to buzzing there. Sorry about that. Um, and um, and I've got this poem that I wrote about the ocean. And I remember, I can't remember whose idea it was. Maybe it was, was it Posey Joe or was it Olive 2008 suggested that we write um, a poem about the ocean that we pollute with microplastics. Um, and so I've got this poem here. Let me show it to you. It's um, It's this. I am sick of poets deconstructing the sea, reducing it to tired characterizations of death or change or a frankly small idea of a woman living out her full emotional range, a convenient package to gift wrap the unimaginable, the unmanageable into pretty bite-sized portions. And so every poem pollutes the ocean whether it's delicate descriptions of white horses tumbling and weaving, careening into cliffs and zagging off course, or the gurgle and slurp of an ill-mannered thrill, ticker tape parades in blue and carpet green. These lovely details refusing to focus on the fact that the ocean is a metaphor for the ocean. Anyway, this is not the poem that originally I sort of got asked to write, which was just a nice pretty poem of the, of the ocean. I think in fact that Maddie did that poem already. And I think, um, I think we can pollute that poem. But this is just sort of like an idea of trying to write a poem about the ocean. And I was like thinking, how do you write a poem about the ocean? I mean, the ocean is so much more fantastic than any poem that I could ever write. And then I thought, well, maybe writing a poem about the ocean is like polluting the ocean because you always kind of get it wrong or reduce it to something else or compare it to something else or make it selfishly about yourself. Um, and and so this was my attempt at trying to like talk about how even the idea of writing a poem about the ocean is pollution. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> let me know what you think of this poem. Uh, let me know what your thoughts are and then um, then maybe we'll get into um, polluting polluting a poem. And we might pollute Maddie's poem. Um, let's have a look. It's amazing, Phil. <laughs> I've got a poem. I dig. You dig. Um, you need to pollute it more. Yes. This poem needs to be polluted. Anyway, let me know what you think. Um, uh, uh, does it sort of, does it make sense? I, I only wrote this in about 20 minutes, so I'm, I'm seeing all these mistakes in it and you can see me scribbling stuff out. This is very much a first draft. Um, it's kind of a humbling experience to put something out there into the world and especially for you guys that I've only spent like 20 minutes on, but uh, in the book, we will uh, we'll spend more time writing and editing. Um, all right, well, before we go into our next session, I thought maybe I would hand things over to Matthew to maybe sort of take us through what does polluting a poem mean? What does polluting, what does, does ocean pollu pollution look like? What are some of the misconceptions? And then maybe we can use that knowledge to pollute a poem. So Matthew, ocean pollution. What's the what's the deal? All right, I'll talk about that. But also, I really want to know this this person Yenny who's just like come up on the chat and tried to tell a joke uh, about something which I didn't really get. Um, but but said that you think it's not a very beautiful poem, but it's quite deep. What do you mean by it not being beautiful? I think I think it's really beautiful. But for me, the fact that it feels like it has like a really strong emotional impact on me that for me is very beautiful. 
um but maybe for you beautiful is is like some kind of um prettiness but i don't, I don't think beauty is the same as, as prettiness uh but i'm wondering what what you think um i missed the joke i'm sorry mate anyway instead of going back to your joke <laughs> do you tell us what you mean about how about the poem because we want to know um yenny do, yenny do you mean that your uncle's not very pretty but he's super deep uh is that what you mean anyway i um i agree with you matthew it is not a pretty poem there's like there's like places where i'm over here where i'm trying to do a um an impression of someone being pretty with a poem in this bit here yeah um and it's almost like i'm doing it kind of a little bit tongue-in-cheek like or, or like i'm i'm overcooking it a little bit like i'm i'm making it really pretty i'm making it really pretty on top of the cupcake um uh almost to say this is how people often des describe the ocean and prettify it um but i think maybe there is a case to be made about having a whole poem that's this kind of description without all this explanation and navel gazing about polluting the ocean with a poem and all that sort of stuff and then inserting pollution of words in here uh throughout the poem and messing it up we could do one of those poems i think for instance maddie's poem is very pretty and we could pollute it a poem like that had a really good rhyme and um but this poem is not that right yeah. let's talk some science okay so um phil do you want to unshare your screen yeah switch it out okay we're back right okay here's a picture of a, a dinosaur soap uh which is a soap that i really want so if anyone uh wants to get me a dinosaur soap uh then please uh you might need to make your own mold and if you do that's obviously fine i don't mind you spending time making a mold if you want to make me a soap that'd be good uh thanks Soap for me uh this has absolutely nothing to do with what i'm going to talk about but it's a nice soap, you gotta admit. You know how like people have collections of things and and when you're really young, you kind of sometimes feel this pressure of like, oh God, I should, I should collect something because other people collect stuff. Uh, I, um, for me, it was soap and I had so much soap and it was ridiculous and eventually I just had to have one big, um, I, I can't remember what I did with them all actually. Anyway, this is irrelevant. Right, so um, concepts that I think would be cool to include in the poem in terms of pollution are, uh, let's talk about how, how plastic pollution works. So let's, um, so if you, if you dump a load of plastic into the ocean or if, if a load of plastic gets dumped into the ocean, then a lot of what you see is the kind of really big bits of plastic, which end up kind of tangling around, uh, around turtles or getting like fish get caught up in them or that kind of stuff. Um, and that's the stuff that's very visual. And because it's very visual, it gets shown around a lot to try and help the campaign against single use plastic to try and stop this, stop these things from, from being used so widely. Um, but that's not really the big problem. What do you guys think is the really, really big problem uh, with, with plastic? What is it, like what, what happens to the plastic that causes it to become very, very problematic over time? What do you guys think over time? And Gala Fruz is saying I used to have a soap collection, I think. Um, dinosaur soap on Amazon. Oh, great. Yeah, just send it send it over. I'd love a dinosaur soap. Um, so Japan people are saying it breaks down and Oliver, Oliver is saying that fish eat it. Yes, exactly. So it's those two things combined. So these big bits of plastic will break down into tiny, tiny pieces of plastic. And then those tiny... This is where the two strands of pollution come together. So you've got your plastic pollution, which is the very... Um, initially very visible kind of pollution and that plastic pollution kind of starts to blend with your oh let's bring a bit of that back come back there we go that went too far um so yeah your plastic pollution will then blend with your kind of chemical pollution so you've got your um chemical pollution which might be being poured into the i'm going to have it out of a conical flask here but ultimately it'll probably be coming out of pipes at the back of factories and running off fields and things so your chemical pollution that also gets poured into the ocean is a problem because a lot of these chemicals are poisons but the theory that's been 
used for such a long time to justify this being not a big enough problem to worry about is that the ocean is huge. The ocean is so huge that even if you're pouring loads and loads of chemicals into it, they'll ultimately get diluted down into nothingness. However, we now have this new problem where these ocean pollutants um, are sticking to plastic. So the, the weird thing about these ocean pollutants is they don't actually like being in water. They hate being in water and so they'll stay on the surface of water all the time. Does anyone know what that's called? What's the name of, of a material that, that hates being in water and will just sit on the surface instead? So Venable Sugar is saying, is it, is it bioaccumulation? So bioaccumulation is where we're heading, but that's not the name of the, of the pollutant sticking on the top. So Olive is saying, is it like oil? Not quite like... Well, oil, you're right, has the same property. Um, okay, no one's saying it, I'll say this. It's, the word is hydrophobic. So hi, what do you guys think that means? Hydrophobic. Phil, what do you think it means? Scared of water? Exactly. <laughs> Terrified of water. Running scared. Um, so mo a lot of the pollutants, chemical pollutants that end up in the ocean from industry, from farming and so on, um, are scared of water like Japan Maple's cousin. And so like Japan Maple's cousin, rather than submerging into the water when they jump in, will just float on the surface as if the water can't touch them. So all these chemicals just float on the surface away from the water in this hydrophobic state. And then when the ocean gets filled with plastic beads, the plastic is suddenly an alternative that the pollutants can stick to instead. So instead of sticking to the surface of the water, they stick to these plastic beads. And literally within minutes of putting plastic into the ocean, the concentration of pollutants on the surface of that plastic is millions of times higher than the rest of the ocean within minutes. Um, and that's more or less anywhere in the world because these pollutants are so widespread, but they are quite dilute. But as soon as you put the plastic in, it all collects together. So that's where the two journeys come together. You've got your chemical pollutants and your plastic pollution coming together to create pieces of plastic covered in chemical pollutants, which are then eaten by fish. And then this feeds into, into Olive's poem um, about about the, the, the journey of plastic. And so Olive was talking about the, the physical idea of these plastic beads being inside the bear. Actually, one of the, one of the things that's even more worrying than that is that even if these plastic beads are eaten by fish and the fish takes them in, the fish can then pass the plastic beads out the other side. But the problem is, is that once they've passed them out the other side, they've already absorbed in their little fishy intestine, they've already absorbed all these pollutants. So you've got fish that are filling up with pollution. And then when a bear eats them, if it's a salmon that's then swimming upstream, the bear then accumulates even more of this, of these pollutants. So we've, we've basically invented by accident an incredibly efficient system for directing all of our ocean pollutants back into the food chain to then arrive back with us. So I think in terms of that, that's a notion I would love to be able to get in the pollution is the idea that we are polluting something that directly supports us. And that's, that's, that's one notion I'd love for people to get across. And, you know, these ocean pollutants are... One of the most famous ones is DDT because there was a big campaign a few decades ago to try and stop it from being poured into the ocean and it became illegal, but there's still loads of DDT in the ocean. Um, but, yeah, one of the, one, another sentiment that I would love to be able to get across with, with the pollution is that we often talk about how, uh, like, all this environmentalism is about trying to save the planet, like save the world, save, um, but, but we're not saving the planet here. Like we are, we are trying to save biodiversity and try to save um, different animals that, that will suffer, but ultimately life will go on. It's just whether it will go on in a way that is stable enough for humans to exist within. Um, because at the moment we're really, we're really destroying the biosphere in, in ways that are making that quite questionable. And one of the big problems is is ocean pollution so that's 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 one thing and then there's one sorry one other thing to add and i know this is quite a few things but so your your pollution we can go down the kind of plastic category the chemical category um and and also that chemical can kind of subdivide into like industry and farming because your industrial chemicals are like the often the really nasty poisons and then the farming ones may not directly be poisons 
but they'll they'll upset the balance of the ocean. So the farming ones might, for example, favour loads of algae growing. So you'll get these huge algal blooms, and then the rest of the stuff that lives in the ocean will be like, well, wait a second, we're not used to having so much algae here. So those are kind of three categories. And then one last category that I'd encourage you to maybe think about when you're thinking of ideas to, to bring this to life is that you could consider carbon dioxide an ocean pollutant because you've got carbon dioxide um, being breathed out by the likes of this dinosaur uh, that, and, and also by burning loads of fossil fuels, which is then going to dissolve in the oceans. And what will that do to the oceans? What, what effect will it have on the oceans as you dissolve loads of carbon dioxide into them? What do you guys think? And while I'm waiting to see what other people think, I'm just going to catch up on bits of chat and see that someone's talking about fresh orange juice definitely beats every other juice. What? It's so much juice chat. Okay. Um, Which links into maybe what happens to the ocean. Acidify. It, acidify. Yeah, acidify. Brilliant. Yes. So Japan Maple is saying that it'll acidify the ocean. And Venable Sugar is saying it changes the pH. So this, again, is a kind of pollution that is occurring because of our activity. Is, is feeding carbon dioxide, which is acidifying the ocean, which is destroying loads of coral, and coral supports approximately one third of all ocean species, a third. And the coral is disappearing extremely rapidly. Uh, and there are parts of the world that we think the coral will be completely gone in a few decades at, at the going rate. So those are a few points of pollution to, to think about. I think plastic, uh, chemicals split into industrial and farming, and then also talking directly about CO2 uh, being being released from our factories. Uh, there's a really good documentary called Chasing Coral on Netflix. Yeah, I know the person who who made it. There, it's uh, there's another great one that I've seen recently called um, oh, it's about it's about the the fish in Mexico that are almost completely extinct, and there are only about fifteen of them left. It's not blackfish. It's something like that. Oh, I've forgotten the name. But yes, uh, that is a great documentary, Chasing Coral. I'd really recommend it. Anyway, I'm going to hand back to Phil because that's enough science from me. Here we go. Okay. All right. Great. Um, well, thank you so much, Matthew. Um, I realize right now how um, maybe ill-equipped I was starting off writing a poem about pollution because it's way more complicated and uh, multifaceted than I thought. And immediately as, as you were talking, I started thinking about not just one idea, but multiple ideas for poems um, around pollution and around the ocean, which is good because if we're going to get a, put a book together, we probably need quite a few poems. Um, and so, I don't know, I um, I love, for instance, I love Olive's poem about the life cycle um, of the microbeads uh, in the ocean, in the fish, in the air. Um, and I wonder if there's a if there's a poem in there that we could write, if we could sort of like um, stitch that up really nicely and make that into a poem, but maybe as well add an element of the um, the chemical in that sort of life cycle sort of poem. Um, I I don't know, like I like the idea maybe of somehow writing a poem about the ocean becoming more acidic and matching that in the words. Uh, so maybe, maybe the, um, maybe like either the poem starts disintegrating. Uh, what are some effects of acidity, Matthew? What are some of effects of ocean acidity? What does that mean? So it's o the thing is, it's only like actually quite a small change in the similar to how, um, you know, as CO2 levels go up, temperature is rising and people are like, oh, who cares if it's only, if it's only a third of a degree of, of change in the past few years or something. It doesn't sound like a lot, but the problem mm. is, is that we live in, you know, if you compare our world where the temperatures basically range between like minus 50 and plus 50 in their extremes, approximately, um, like that, that 100 degree back gap sounds quite big to us, but actually when you compare it to the temperatures in the universe that range from like minus 270 all the way up to the, the thousands, um, you realize that we're actually on this very, very narrow band. And and if temperatures change even a little bit, then so, there are some living things that are very, very sensitive to that, and they'll start to die out. And then the things that depend on eating those things, or depend on the nutrients they provide, or the structure they provide, will die out as well. So 
and 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 it like just a, t a small change if it happens too quickly so that things don't have time to adapt can be really disastrous and it's similar with acidity so the acidity increase is actually really small but the problem is is that you've got all this coral that the normal lifetime the normal like life of a coral and watch my i made a little video on this called um corals uh, i can't remember what it's called but if you go on my youtube you can see you can see a video about coral where i explain this but essentially you got your little baby coral it spends its life swimming around it chooses the best algae to pair up with that is really really suited to producing food given the current ocean environment and then it attaches to the kind of block of coral that you see in the in the pictures like for the colorful the colorful structures and it just stays there for the rest of its life ideally with the same algae just like going about its life but now we're creating a situation where the ideal algae is changing so much, even within the lifespan of a tiny little piece of coral, that, that these all these corals have to keep finding a new chef. Because the, the algae is essentially the chef that's making food for the coral. So they need to find a new chef because they're like, oh crap, well, like this, this, this chef, this algae is no longer good enough to make me food because of the tiny increase in pH. I need to find another one. But they're not kids anymore. These little coral, they're not babies. They can't swim around and find the best algae. They need to just stay where they are because they're stuck. And suddenly, if everyone's doing it, then it's like it's like everyone in, is trying to hire a chef. There aren't that many chefs. I don't even know anyone who has a private chef. Um, but but like that that's that's essentially the problem is that every single a coral now is like trying to find a new algae, and they just aren't enough to go around, and they can't move around and find them, and so. It's so this this pollution of acidity is is very subtle. It's very small, but the impact it has is enormous. Mm. Oh, Matthew, like I love I love hearing these things and immediately. Like we have lots of uh, kind of chat on the line about oh no, they're they're life partners. Is that why they bleach? They go to divorce. Um, yeah, and uh, I I kind of like this. I think maybe that there, there is something in that maybe, which is like, maybe a poem, which is uh, like a advert in the classified, you know, chef, chef wanted, or like something, some, something where the um, demand is high and supply is low. Um, or, or maybe it's like a, a lot of a, a kind of like a longing poem of longing for um, someone to come and feed them or where has my lover gone i don't know there's there's something there there's something there um we've got lots of ideas for poems uh but what i one thing i've really appreciated from all of you is all your ideas uh it was uh it was a great idea for this um polluting a poem which we don't have time we've got to finish up now but um one thing that I will do is I'm going to have, if Maddie's okay with this, I'm going to have Maddie's poem and I'm going to, how can I post it so people can see it? Um, Instagram? Instagram, okay. Or, or we've also got I'm a poetry gonna... page on, on the website. On the website, we've got a poetry page. So we can post it on okay. there. Um, okay. I'm going to put it on the poetry page on the website and then I want you to have your best idea, your best go polluting that poem with um and just messing it up mucking it up with um and put your spin on it creatively in line with what matthew was talking about how pollution works um so maybe that's for instance it's starting off big and then it's breaking down and then it's joining with something else um however it is or let's mess up um, maddie's poem and then we'll come back to that next week um and we'll also pick up and start writing a new poem as well. I think for the moment, we're gonna focus on the ocean. We've got lots of ideas for the ocean. And um, uh, so I'll have a think about that. Maybe we'll think of life cycle poems. Maybe we'll think of acidity poems. Um, uh, there's still heaps of ideas that we haven't got to yet. Rebecca Carmen, if you're on the chat, really want you to get on that graph of the CO2 levels and how they are increasing and maybe doing a poem that matches that in a sort of pictorial way. CO2levels.org, uh, great website. What was that? CO2levels.org, CO2 great website by the Two org. Degrees Institute. Yeah, yeah. Great. Um, Anyway, we've got lots to go off. Thank you so much for your... 
Oh, Phyllis just vanished last minute. He's just paused. Okay. Okay, wait up everyone. We'll just wait for Phil to come back. Um... <laughs> Phil? Hello? Hello? Phil? Right, well, I think Phil's internet has died. I mean, look, but unless he's just frozen in that position, which would be really impressive. Um, but I don't think he has. But ultimately, we were finishing off, so it's fine. Uh, and I will uh, just go to here and say thanks so much for coming. Uh, if you would like to and you haven't already, do sign up for our schedule. You can do so on our, our website. Uh, and do follow our socials as well. Um, the, so on Aim High Live and also uh, on, well, it's Aim High Live on YouTube and Twitch and TikTok and Instagram and everything. And uh, oh, and I think we've got Phil back to say goodbye. But also, if you haven't already, do. Oh, goodbye. I don't know what happened there. Uh, yeah, he froze. He just froze for a moment, but it's quite fun actually because we got a good frozen image of it. Um, oh dear! But yeah, thanks so thanks so much for coming all, and we will see you. Um, we'll see you next week. Thank you. Farewell. See you guys. Ciao. Bye bye.